right? So thank you for setting up the suspense of the scripture reading this morning, Roger. No, it's awesome. All right, so this is out of this week's lectionary. And when I first saw it, I thought, okay, there's no way I'm preaching on that. That is just never going to happen. Well, as I entered into looking at what I wanted to talk about, I kept getting that nudge that this is the very thing I was going to be talking about. So um, here we go. All right. So our scripture is out of Luke. And um, Luke 12, 49 to 56. This is Jesus speaking. I came to bring fire to the earth and how I wish it were already kindled. I have a baptism to which to be baptized, and what stress I am under until it is completed. Do you think that I have come to bring peace on earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. From now on, okay, I think that's a drop the mic moment, actually. <laughs> um, from now on, five in one household will be divided, three against two and two against three. They will be divided, father against son, son against father, mother against daughter, and daughter against mother, mother-in-law against daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. Okay, I think there's a quiz here coming. <laughs> he also said to the crowds, when you see a cloud rising into the west, you immediately say, it's going to rain, and so it happens. And when you see the south wind blowing, you say, there will be scorching heat, and it happens. You hypocrites, you know how to interpret the appearance of earth and sky, but why do you not know how to interpret the present time? Okay, so this is not the happy, clappy Jesus sermons that you usually hear from me at the children's moment. This fiery and rarely quoted Jesus passage is not one that we generally teach to our young people as a first scripture passage to memorize. But the cost of discipleship leads to pain, like the cost of love, the cost of being a mom. We come to understand that it isn't easy. It's not an amorphous, otherworldly suffering, but following Jesus will call you specifically into conflict, division, death, destruction of what was, so we can commit to what can be. Not just come to me all who are weary and I will give you rest. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. It's, I'm gonna put a yoke on you. So here we go. If we're idolizing church growth, this may be a scary and not a popular message. We would do much better to hear the prosperity gospel. If you're faithful and good, it'll lead to good things. I don't think Jesus, in this case, is prescribing conflict, but I think he's describing it. There will be conflict, and as I was struggling with this passage, I kept hearing, Kathy, the gospel is good news. So here we go. This passage is good news. All right, so if you're a visitor, like we said, this is not the first passage we teach our young children here at church, and it's also generally not one that we share at premarital counseling about daughter-in-laws against mother-in-laws. <laughs> but I have seen this principle play out many times in our own families here at church. The power of Jesus' compassion and care that shatters the status quo. Someone in a family wakes up to dimensions of God's love that lead them to have the courage to make positive changes for themselves. I've seen Jesus call teenagers to change their lives in a way that require huge costs to be paid in challenging dysfunctional family and friend dynamics and required changes that brought conflict, death of old ways, and family patterns that ultimately led to their resurrection. I've watched moms faithfully walk this path and it has a trickle-down benefit for their children. While that process is often disruptive and painful to go through, that is the very thing that will happen when we follow him, and I think Jesus is bringing it to our attention so we won't be thrown off or feel so disrupted when it happens. In psychotherapy, they say, you name it to tame it. I'm wondering if that isn't what Jesus is doing in some way. The scripture passage really is one of the most uncomfortable passages in the New Testament, and one of the passages most difficult for casual Christians to embrace. 
After all, isn't Jesus Prince of Peace? And the Savior? And the Messiah? Isn't Jesus' message and teaching all about love? And if we just focus on love, love, more love, well, there would be no conflict or division, right? Are any of us married? <laughs> Do we have any relationships that really matter to us? <coughs> Several years ago, a friend in this church went home to her husband and said, I think Kathy and Kip may be having some marital problems. To which he replied, Diane, if they're married, they're having marital problems. <laughs> Thank you, Tony Steller. <laughs> A, a profound comment and a great reminder about the very nature and organizing principle of love and relationships. Where there is love and where we care, there is struggle, division, and tension when one wakes up to a new dimension of life. What is the purpose of this kind of love? Author Rob Bell says, the universe is rigged for your growth. I love that. God the Creator, who has called all life into existence, has set things up for growth, and it seems all growing involves some tension and discomfort. When a teenager is going through so many changes, they often experience physical discomfort we call growing pains. The same is true whenever we grow through learning, oh sorry, when we're growing in any area, physical growth through exercise, intellectual growth through learning, and even in spiritual growth through experience, reflection, prayer, and revelation. And Jesus the Messiah, God's anointed one, knows that the growth experience he is called to bring to the world will result in growing pains of enormous proportions. And it seems he even knows, according to this passage, that these growing pains will lead to his death. When he says, I have a baptism, baptism with which to be baptized, and what stress I am under, in, under until it is completed, he's referencing his impending martyrdom. Jesus has already been baptized physically by John in the Jordan River. Remember, all baptism is meant to symbolize the death of the old way of life and the invitation and celebration of a resurrection into a new way of life. Jesus reminds us that baptism is an ongoing process, not a once and done, and for Jesus, his baptismal path will lead to his death and resurrection. And he faithfully continues on that path to which he was called. Why? What is the purpose of love? What is the goal of love? Why are we here in church today? In our bylaws, it reads, The purpose of this church shall be to bind together followers of Jesus Christ for the purpose of sharing in the worship of God and in making God's will dominant in the lives of all its members, individually and collectively, especially as that will is set forth in the life, teaching, death, and resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth. Is that why you're here today? Paul calls it being a cloud of witnesses. We are called in love by God. We are called in love by God to be in community with others. We are called in love by God to enter into that love when we grow into it through Jesus and all that we learn and embrace through his life, teaching, death, and resurrection. And if we do that, we will experience growing pains and tension and division. In a word, conflict. Jean Venier, the founder of La Arche, the famous community for disabled and non-disabled in France, says, Communities need tensions if they are to grow and deepen. Tensions become conflicts. A tension or difficulty can signal the approach of a new grace of God. But it has to be look at, looked at wisely and humanely. Rob Bell says a question he often gets asked is, what do I do if I'm growing and changing and my spiritual perspectives are expanding? but my family and friends aren't seeing what I'm seeing. Jesus points out to us here that our families are not necessarily going to find our new ideas and spiritual path energizing. Verse 51, do you think I have come to bring peace on earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. Families and communities have an ethos, a way of operating, a center of gravity, 
Rob Bell calls it when he says, the center of gravity dictates the way things operate and dictates what is acceptable and what is unacceptable, especially as it involves growth or change. When someone comes in all excited about whatever new way of operating seems enticing, the community usually does not usually embrace this with open arms. Often there's an enormous amount of energy expended to quell the disruption, pushing it to the edges, discrediting it. Does that sound like an experience that you've ever had? When you wake up and become conscious, start to become aware of your calling, you will always get resistance. One of life's dirty little secrets is that we all want to be able to operate on autopilot unconsciously. But have you ever sat next to someone at a dinner party who's unconscious? <laughs> we all think we want this easy, what one of my friends calls, water skiing type of life, just skimming the surface. Are those the relationships you find meaningful? Division, pain, standing up for what is right. That is the bigger message. Bigger than just staying together. Unity for unity's sake is not faithful and led many to follow lockstep behind the Nazi power. We don't want to rock the boat. I recently heard a podcast on healthy churches where one minister said, I'm tired of hearing about consensus building. That should not be our ultimate goal. No, that's not a good idea. There's no point where Jesus says, let's build some consensus. There's an interesting piece that consensus building can end up creating a tyranny of a minority that refuses to be in consensus and also silences too often and bullies too many voices in the room. One of the powerful things this passage does is address head on the blessing that conflict can be. And churches that acknowledge it and address it tend to be healthier than churches that instead lacquer over rotten wood with niceness. Tyranny of niceness can also be an epidemic. Conflict and what a blessing conflict can be Conflict can create true, real, and lasting reconciliation. Martin Luther said, peace is not the absence of conflict or tension, it's the presence of justice. And I think that is shalom, true peace. How can we be in communities when communities are divided? How can we work through and within conflict to be built toward the kingdom? Now, following Jesus doesn't mean to go pick a fight with your family. It means when you grow, others will become uncomfortable and you will face opposition. Authentic community always involves spiritual growth. The more spiritually mature you are, the more you will find your heart being drawn to people. You will want to reach out to people in order to heal relationship and grow. Dallas Willard calls it the unity of spiritual orientation. To understand Jesus' teachings, we must realize that deep in our orientations of our spirit, we cannot have one posture toward God and a different one toward people. We are a whole being, and our true character pervades everything we do. We cannot, for example, love God and hate human beings. If we are supposed to live in the stream of forgiveness and reconciliation and mercy with God and human beings, how are we to do it if we are not willing to enter into situations that might bring conflict? I heard someone say, if you want peace, don't talk to your friend. Talk to your enemy. But relationships take time. And if you think you can fit deep community into cracks of an overloaded schedule, think again. Wise people do not try to microwave friendship, parenting, or marriage. The requirement for true intimacy is chunks of unhurried time. So how does your schedule look? And is it helping or hindering you from entering into deep community? How can you realistically pursue greater relationship depth today? Coercion and manipulation are shortcuts in relationships, as are avoiding and ignoring. It takes time and intention to enable and inspire. So great, how do we resolve conflict? Well, Jesus doesn't just leave us hanging. It's hard to ta start talking about Jesus in one sermon because everything he says is built on something that came before, and he also just doesn't let us leave us hanging without an answer. So Jesus does give us a formula for resolving conflict, specifically within the church. 
So here's his plan of action to resolving conflict between two people. So this introduction is a single statement of Jesus recorded in the Gospel of Matthew. Here it goes. If your brother or sister sins against you, go and show them their fault. Just between the two of you, if they listen to you, you have won them over. So Jesus' introduction here, I'm saying, can be broken down into seven steps. Okay, number one, if there is conflict. Number two, you. Number three, go. Number four, to the person. <laughs> number five, in private. Number six, and discuss the problem. Number seven, for the purpose of reconciliation. So a little description on each of the steps. Number one, acknowledge conflict. If your brother or sister sins against you, we might replace the word if with when. Conflict is an inescapable part of being an imperfect human being. Number two, you. I guess he means me here. <laughs> I must own responsibility. Jesus calls us to own the task to step up and seek reconciliation. Now there's another teaching where Jesus instructs the person to take the first step when they are the sinner. But I think in both cases, Jesus is putting the burden of responsibility on whoever is awake and aware enough to recognize a relationship breakdown and calls them actively to seek reconciliation. All right, so I, um, okay. Also, I think he calls us to bring with you our real selves, most transparent self. Every one of us pretends to be healthier and kinder than we really are. <laughs> I have heard that called depravity management. <laughs> We're pretty good at hiding our true selves. The irony of the masks we hide behind is that although we wear them to make other people think well of us, other people are drawn to us only when we take the masks off. So number three, go. Approach. Don't avoid the person you're in conflict with. Nothing can kill community or deep relationships like avoidance. It also causes resentment to fester. The point is not to go to the other person and do this flawlessly, though, by the way. You might stammer over your words and not do it perfectly, but that's not a problem. The main thing is to go. We're in charge of the footwork. God's in charge of the results. And remember, we all fall short of the glory of God. We all stumble in many ways. Number four to the person. No third parties. Don't bring someone else into the picture. And talking and gossiping to everybody else about it won't do much good either. Number five, in private, use sensitivity. You don't have to embarrass somebody by needlessly forcing someone to respond in front of an audience. Number six, discuss the problem, which is direct communication. There's this last 10% rule. When talking through a difficult situation, we set the stage, maybe narrate the context, talk about everything around the problem, and we often fail to speak clearly about the hardest and most important truth, which has been called the last 10%. Number seven, aim at reconciliation. The goal and purpose of this is always about reconciliation, not to win or score points. The goal is to restore the relationships. Reconciliation is rarely simple, and almost never quick, but it is Jesus' will for the human race. It is his express command for his church. If this is not the goal, all the rest of our work will be for nothing. Now, if this doesn't work, there are further instructions. Read the book. It's really good. <laughs> Matthew 18, 15 to 17. So... Here we go. In our scripture reading, there's also a part two message. When Jesus says, when you see a cloud rising in the west, you immediately say it's going to rain, and so it happens. And when you see the south wind blowing, you say there will be scorching heat, and it happens. And then he admonishes, saying, you hypocrites, you know how to interpret the appearance of earth and sky, but what you do not know is how to in interpret the present time. So during Jesus' day, the word hypocrite was translated as actor or a stage player, a performer. I think here again, Jesus is calling us to take off our masks 
and to recognize when we are play acting, talking about the weather and are not even paying attention to what's happening in the present moment. So over the last several years, I've had my, I mean last several weeks, sorry, I've had my own challenge of paying attention to the present moment. Since the birth of my children, I've been preparing for each of their departure out of the nest. Anna Freud, daughter of psychologist Sigmund Freud, says this about being a mother. Our job is to be there, to be left. A mom is constantly preparing for the next stage of her child's growth, development, and independence. This week was a milestone week for me. It's the new beginning after the end of what has been a 30-year and one-month career in calling. I'm going to try not to cry now. We dropped off our fourth and youngest child for college last weekend. She's going to be playing volleyball, which is a fall sport. So we moved her up and into her school a month and a half before school starts. She was the first of her friends to head to college. Leading up to this momentous day, lots of memories went through my mind. I wondered if I had been a good enough mom. Had I given her all the information that she, she will need to know for this next step? They say parenting has three major stages. Cop, then you move to coach, and then you move to consultant. <laughs> I was trying to be present and make for, for all the times I might have missed being present along the way in the last 18 years. And I think I moved back into coach role instead of consultant. That had given her lots of freedom and personal responsibility. Turns out, she told her dad that you and mom have both been great until the last two weeks when you went insane. <laughs> I guess the benign neglect she received from me during the previous times was seen as a good thing to her. I had gone back to coach, and maybe a little to cop, and from her perspective, that was insane. <laughs> the key is to know when to transition from one phase to another. And moving too quickly or too slowly has repercussions that Jesus encourages us to consider. On the morning we dropped her off, all the parents of freshmen were in the media room with the coaches, trainers, and staff, sitting quite awkwardly until the meeting started. Somehow, I blurted out, Hi, my name is Kathy, and I'm an empty nester. <laughs> <laughs> the next phase is actually here. We all introduced ourselves. And the coach commented that this meeting was to help rip the band-aid off quickly. <laughs> he introduced the theme for the year for the athletic program at Stanford. Next starts now. This next empty nesting stage of my life that had been looming for so many years had arrived. Next starts now. And it seems to me that this theme is also relevant to my personal life, family life, and community. In our faith community, if we stay stuck in past failures or past successes, we limit the possibility of what God is doing in this moment in time. In our passage this morning, Jesus is frustrated, calling out the disciples of knowing how to interpret all the things like forecasting the weather, but ask them, but why do you not know how to interpret the present time? There's also an addendum to today's scripture that is critical for us to hear when Jesus tells the disciples to reconcile now not to wait to be taken to the judge. This is really a rally try, cry calling us to our next step. Next starts now, awareness. I have the feeling that a lot of changes are on the horizon. Reconciliation and a new normal kind of relationship with my husband seems to be a big theme for people at this time. For every one of us, there's a personal season or stage of life into which we are living. As a community, there's a season or stage of communal life into which we are living. Are those seasons connected? Remember our purpose statement? We are bound together to discern God's will for our lives, individually and collectively. Not just individually, and not just collectively, but together. What is your next? What is your now? What is our next? What is our now? What Jesus is telling us as directly and forcefully as he knows how is next starts now. Please join me in prayer. Dear
dear God, may your peace be with us this morning, this afternoon, this evening, and always. May we experience that peace even in times that you are waiting and wondering just what it is you are calling us to do, even entering into conflict. May the growth of God's saving grace be with us through it all. May we know that God favors us, that we are loved. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us 